Well, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I think one of the things that happen when you're in a tropical climate, you get a lot of rain. So with our tropical weather, uh, you know, you expected a lot of rain. So we have to mow the lawn at any time. So uh, this, this, what snow? We're, <laughs> we're tropical here. So uh, good morning again, and uh, I, uh, I just want to uh, say that we really appreciate everybody's effort and the dialogue and the open discussion we had. Uh, we had all of our governance committees have uh, been meeting, including one that uh, we just finished at uh, seven, started at 7.15 in the morning. Our friends from different time zones were, uh, were kind uh, enough to accept that, uh, to start that early, and uh, we just finished the uh, the SAC, which is a strategic advisory committee meeting. Uh, we had the technical advisory committee also meeting yesterday, and we, uh, we're, we're glad that we actually, uh, you're here so we can have this meeting face to face. So this is the agenda for today, and we made some minor changes based on the feedback uh, that we received from you yesterday. It seems like all of you, uh, like uh, the, the industry uh, session where we heard from our colleagues uh, from six companies, and uh, today we are adding a session, uh, just moving things around a little bit so you can hear more from our colleagues from trade associations. They have um, excellent perspective uh, relating to their industry sector, related to their membership. So we will have a session with our colleagues from trade associations uh, that will start <clears throat> at 10.15. At so we're looking forward to this session, to hearing the perspective of uh, our colleagues from uh, trade association, different industry group, representing uh, their sectors, and uh, and uh, that that I, I hope that that will be uh, very helpful to everyone here. Uh, uh, right after uh, my presentation here, we will have the best practices panel, so you will hear from people about the best practices. Uh, giving the experience we had with the first uh, project call, we want to make sure that you. You hear from people who are reviewers of this proposal. You hear from people who have seen a lot of proposal and, and hear from them directly in terms of what they think uh, was, was some of the best practices to ensure that you, uh, that would help you as you prepare proposals uh, in the future. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we'll have a, a short break at 10 o'clock and then we have the trade organization panel and hopefully that will shed light on some of the, the priorities uh, for our folk, for our colleagues in the, in the trade association. One of the things also that we mentioned yesterday is that we, uh, we've been working diligently on a tool that allow people to, uh, submitting proposal to estimate the impact of their own projects. And uh, we have some data there, and as Magdi said yesterday, if you have other data that you would like to use also, uh, you're welcome uh, to do that as long as you provide justification for it. Uh, but this is this is a tool that I think is going to make uh, make it easier for people submitting proposal to uh, to calculate and estimate the value and the impact of their proposal. So hopefully that would help guide them as they uh, they develop proposal or look for alternatives, alternative ideas to submit. Uh, during the lunch, we will have uh, member capability showcases. So we ask uh, our members who actually have capabilities and, and uh, resources that they would like to make others aware of. So as you uh, look for teaming, as you look for a proposal opportunity, um, you know, hopefully uh, looking into and seeing what people have to offer I think might be very helpful in that regard. So a lot of our colleagues who are having posters about their capabilities will be around so you can chat with them. And, and also this is the lunchtime now, we move the networking session to that lunchtime. So that would be, uh, and we extended the lunchtime hour, so here it's an hour and a half, so you can actually have opportunity to talk to, uh, to your colleagues here and, and also uh, a chance uh, to uh, work also on teaming opportunities. So we're going to close with a session actually looking into the strategic initiatives, so we're going to get feedback from you. We will have no PowerPoint slides or anything, but we're going to hear from you. We're going to uh, uh, listen to your ideas. Um, related to uh, future directions. Uh, we'll also talk about future uh, RFPs and, and the, uh, the, the topics that we think are going to be included in future RFPs. So it's going to be an open discussion. We're going to hear from you, and we're going to capture some of the ideas uh, that you have for us. 
And we're going to also talk to you about some of the strategic initiatives for the Institute. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to the best practices panel. And um, let's see. Meg, OK, and Maggie is going to facilitate that session. Any questions uh, before we move on to uh, the next panel? All right, we're going to have a panel on best practices, uh, and that'll start in a little bit. But before we uh, get going on that, we wanted to just give you some highlights of uh, things that we saw from the last proposals that we think would be helpful. This isn't a, a, a regurgitation of what you heard yesterday. It's things that we see uh, that were uh, ways that you could be more effective in communicating things. Uh, these Manufacturing USA Institute proposals, a little bit different than maybe some of the proposals you might submit to NSF or other agencies. So we just want to help you uh, through that. And so uh, in talking with the panel, they suggested that we would um, have this information up first, and then uh, we'll bring them up uh, to give you a chance to talk about uh, and ask questions. So. Um, the agenda is, again, just the, the best practices. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about SOPOs, uh, preliminary SOPOs, and just some highlights so you know how to write those effectively. Uh, we've got one slide on budgets, just, again, uh, with a caveat that if you've got questions, please uh, contact uh, our finance team to ask how to fill those out. And then we've got uh, four panelists from the last <laughs> time. So. Uh, you know, you, you're going to start the day with a story. And so we had an offsite uh, when I was at, at Global Research, and uh, part of the offsite was on how do you tell that elevator pitch. You know, and so we went through some exercises, and then our manager had to stand up in front, and he would flash up a, 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 a um, you know, elevator, and bing, you know, Jeff Immelt's there, or bing, your department manager's there, or whoever it is. and, and just to get people in the habit of practicing elevator speeches so you can say what you need to say in the time that you've got to say it. And, you know, as we start, in a sense, that's what your executive summary is or your project summary. That's your elevator speech. Um, I think I mentioned it yesterday, but when we would do red team reviews of proposals at the research center, uh, we'd go through the whole proposal, but at the beginning we'd ask the reviewers, usually four of them, for feedback. And almost every time they, they would say things like, your executive summary just does not pop, is the term that we would use. But essentially it meant, I read it, but I don't know what you're doing. So the project summary should tell us uh, everything that you're doing in one page. Uh, and it's, it takes a while to get there, but we've given you some uh, leading questions. I mean, you can literally almost take each of these questions and turn them into a paragraph. Um, it takes a lot of time to do it. Some people write it as the last thing they do after they got through the whole proposal. I tend to write it as the first thing I, I do, but it, e either event. And so, again, it's what's the problem, how have people tried to solve it, you know, who's on your team and what are you guys going to do. A and when you're saying what are you going to do is, you know, we're going to work on recycling of uh, PET. Uh, that doesn't tell me anything. What specifically are you going to do? Uh, what are the key elements of your approach? What are those pieces of your proposal that, you know, make up your proposal? So we've got team member A who's doing this, team member B who's doing this, and, and C who's doing that. What are you going to deliver at the end of the project? Um, specifically, what are the things that come out of the project? And the last piece is what's the broader impact? And again, uh, we talked about this yesterday, saying we're going to contribute to a 30% reduction in primary feedstocks that's not actionable uh, because it's what's the requirements of the TPMs, but it's not what your project is going to deliver. You're contributing to it. Tell us how much you're going to have an impact on that. So, so if you've got questions along the way, please uh, feel free to stop me. Um, technical approach. Um, the way I like to think about this is break it up into your pieces. What are the th two or three or four key pieces of technology that you're working on in your project? Who's working on those projects? Um, 
like who's responsible for those, each of those peop, uh, uh, pieces, and, and why is it better? You know, as technical people, we like to write, we like to get into the technical things and we want to, you know, we, we like the whole proposal to be like a, maybe an executive summary and 20 pages of our great technology and then, you know, closing notes. But um, it really is important to be able to tell and break down into chunks what those uh, approaches are. The other thing I would say is if you've got three pieces of technology that you're talking about, A, B, and C, as you go throughout the proposal, the rest of the sections, talk about the benefits, talk about the tech transition in that order, A, B, C, so people get to expect what you're gonna, they're going to see on the back end. Um, a couple things that we saw, uh, and again, these are suggestions uh, of errors to avoid. If you're putting in a full proposal, um, a full proposal isn't a place to say, well, we got some ideas, we're going to try three or four of them, we're going to see what sticks to the wall. Um, we had, um, you know, through the last reviews, um, you know, th that kind of exploratory work is appropriate for exploratory programs. Um, the other piece that we sometimes saw uh, or that we see is where you've got a bunch of groups and they're all working on some technology, but none of it fits together into an integrated whole. It's like I talk to my buddy over here and my buddy over here and we put them into uh, a, a proposal, but it's not clear how everything relates to itself. Um, quantification. Uh, again, I, I don't want to have to go through uh, the reading of the slides because I'm sure you'd much rather hear from the, the panelists. But one of the things that we saw, again, is quantify what the impact of your project is. Again, not one of the TPMs, but what will you deliver? And I think of the 17 proposals that were funded, um, the majority of them didn't do that last time, but the ones that did, it was very easy to see what they were doing. <coughs> We're going to have that session that Nabil mentioned on the uh, impact calculator, so that will help you quantify those benefits. Um, the other thing, and I would say this uh, to the industry members, clearly you're working on these projects because it will provide a benefit to your company, and we understand that. But talk about it in terms of the broader impact to the industry. Um, if it only looks like it's very specific to your company and it doesn't uh, move Remade's metrics forward, uh, or help remade and its members, um, that um, kind of raised red flags with reviewers. And so, again, just as an example, uh, and this is a fictitious example, but, you know, it kind of gives you the, the, the buzzwords, you know. So if you're working on PET recycling, at the end of the project to recover PET from whatever it is, the consumer products industry will have access to 12 million metric tons of FDA-compliant RPET. That way people can see, yeah, it's helping our company, but it's also helping the industry more broadly. So because these are pretty competitive, it should be um, hopefully easy to tell that story. Um, um, technology transition. Again, it's important to talk about what you're going to deliver at the end of the project and in what form. Um, I w did a project uh, back in 2016. Uh, for the DMDII, uh, the uh, Digital Manufacturing and Design Innovation Institute in Chicago. And what I did is I worked with a team to go through the 53 projects they had in their portfolio to look at what was coming out of those projects. So they had funded a bunch of projects, but it wasn't clear how they all fit together. It wasn't clear how they moved the needle forward in digital manufacturing. And so we broke it down, you know, using the TRLs as a guideline. And we looked at what were the um, critical technology elements that came out of each project um, that could be applied across the industry and what technology maturity level were they at. Um, three years or two and a half years in probably wasn't the right time to start that, but we needed to get a sense of how do we move this forward. I know in talking to some of the other institutes at the peer review um, where they funded projects and they're great projects to fund, they're now struggling to see how they all fit into the bigger whole. And so some of the things we talked to you today about or yesterday about around calculating impacts was really about trying to see, uh, again, around the roadmap, how everything fits together and contributes to the TPMs. Um, another thing that shows that you understand what the uh, what you're working on and why it's relevant to industry is what level of improvement do you need to achieve? You know, I, um, 
I often see people talk about, you know, extrapolating things, and, and we would do this too. So I, we did a DARPA proposal once where we were talking about using uh, femtosecond lasers to drill cooling holes in turbine blades to get much better um, efficiency of, of turbine blades. And, and, you know, in those kind of proposals, obviously you, you, you like to do things like, if applied to the whole uh, airline industry, it would save three million barrels of oil, you know, a, a year. Um, now the reality is nobody was going to go drill, redrill all those holes that are out there flying, but it gives you a sense of what that projection is. But, but again, talk about what level of performance needs to hit. If I can do this, how much is it going to move the dial? You might not get all the way there, but help us understand, you know, what's the level of performance that's required? How are you contributing to that? Because again, it shows that it's more than a technology project. It's got an outcome that people care about. Um, and again, you know, there's that piece of, so what's next? And this is from uh, one of the slides that Nabil showed yesterday. You know, the core activities that comes out of the DOE funding are addressing those knowledge gaps uh, and proving feasibility. You know, we're trying to reduce the barriers uh, that will motivate subsequent in industry adoption. And so if we can articulate uh, how well we're doing relative to that, uh, it, it makes it more compelling. Team qualifications, again, uh, it should be somewhat obvious, uh, but, uh, you know, show how you have exact, uh, you know, it's great, it would be better if you had direct experience working on this technology before. You've got some uh, proof that you know what you're doing, you've been successful working on pieces of these puzzles before. Again, relevant facilities, equipment, and resources. Uh, you know, do you have the right uh, equipment to be able to carry out this work? Or do you have access to the right equipment to be able to carry out this work? Um, those are important things to help the, the reviewers um, understand. Uh, in that context, I think one of the things um, to think about is, uh, again, your whole proposal should be a story of why you're uniquely qualified to carry out this work. And so people who talk about we've got an SEM or we've got, you know, uh, you know, kind of the tools of the trade, everybody has that or many people have that. It's not a differentiating capability. But if you've got, you know, a, a facility to, uh, that is unique where you can kind of scale things up in your labs, uh, that's very helpful. So, uh, again, don't describe things that are, you know, commodity uh, kind of capabilities, I guess, is what I was trying to say. Um, again, some things that we saw this last time were around, um, hey, I've got this technology. I've applied it over here successfully. I'm going to apply it to this totally different domain space, um, which is great. We want to leverage previous development. But in some cases, if you don't have any previous experience in that domain, um, bring people along who do because, you know, it's not, if you don't, if you don't have people on the team who have that domain experience, it's not clear that you can easily translate what you did over here to another domain. Again, industry engagement, uh, very crucial um, to all of these proposals, and we do really very much appreciate all the support that we're getting and the guidance uh, from our industry members. So a word about graphics. Uh, I, I just threw these in this morning, but, but again, you know, it's hard to write a proposal in the space that you have limited. A graphic can sometimes take up the equivalent of three quarters of a page of text and communicate the same thing. So again, this is a silly example, but it gives you an idea. You know, you visually process things. Um, there was a proposal coordinator at the research center, and what he would have his teams do is he would say, we're going to lay out the key pictures or the key graphics for the entire proposal before they ever put pen to paper. So that, you know, if you looked at each of those graphics, you could tell exactly what that project was about. It kind of was a way to guide uh, people through the reviews. So I just gave an example. This is an example from a, a previous proposal I had worked on uh, with a, a team. But uh, a good place where to use graphics is to talk about your technology approach. So again, I talked about it earlier. What are the key elements? What's part A, part B, part C? 
show them graphically. And so this was a, a project that had four specific uh, technical elements. We had four different uh, universities and companies working on each pieces of, of the puzzle. But it was a way to graphically see what are you doing. Uh, again, guiding the, the reviewer forward so they can understand what's happening. And, and even in those graphics, using pictures sometimes, uh, you know, flow charts going left to right are good um, things. But make the pictures compelling uh, about telling the story you're trying to tell. So I'm going to have Brian come up, um, uh, Brian Rice. Uh, he's one of our project managers. And while he'll, he's making his way up, I'll just tell another quick story. So uh, my last job at GE, I was in business development. So my job was to work with the folks at the research center to bring in funding from external agencies and companies. And when I was interviewing, one of the guys who had been doing it a long time said, the way to be successful in this job is come to our uh, kickoff meetings for your proposal with the statement of work already figured out, with understanding who on the team is doing what. Because if you have that laid out, it's very easy to write. Otherwise, you're, what you may do, uh, and I've done this before, is you end up uh, writing a bunch of technical stuff, and then you're like, oh, I've got to put together the work breakdown structure. Oh, I forgot about that. And then you end up circling back to rewrite. So if you know who's doing what and, and, and who's uh, responsible for what, it makes it really easy to tell the propose, uh, t talk through the proposal. So let me turn it over to Brian, um, and then uh, we'll uh, talk budget real quick and bring the panel back up. Good morning. So uh, for the next few minutes, I want to talk about everyone's favorite subject who's been working on these. How do you go backwards? Uh, there, there, okay. These weird Macs. Okay, so first we're going to talk about what a SOPO is, the, and then the different elements of the SOPO, and then just some, uh, some exam, uh, you know, just some basic formatting issues, examples of how to name and, and put together summaries of the tasks and subtasks, and making the milestones smart and, and go, no go, when are they needed? And then there's some additional reminders that are in the slide deck. We may not be able to get to those time-wise. So a SOPO is a statement of project objectives. So it's really going to be used as a guide to measure your progress in the project. So in, uh, in the proposals this time, there's going to be this preliminary SOPO. So we'll really focus on the components of that preliminary SOPO in this discussion. And, and that'll include sections C and D. Sections A and B of the SOPO are kind of more related to bits and pieces from the proposal itself. But, but we'll focus on sections C and D in this uh, preliminary proposal. And, and as a disclaimer, they, the, the SOPO in the proposal should follow the ins written instructions in the RFP itself. These are just some guidelines. Maybe I say some things that are not quite exactly 100%, but these are kind of some learnings that we've, uh, we've had as we've gone through these. And uh, these are quite rigorous requirements, as those of you who we've been working on in SOPOs know, we're, we're going back and forth to get these, get these very clear, uh, cleared up. And, and, and as, as in a uh, comparison, the proposal versus the SOPO, the proposals, as, as Mag Magdi described, covers, uh, you know, the project goals, what it's, what's going to be covered, and the project team. The SOPOs, though, they're going to be very s explicitly describing the different tasks, what your, the milestones are going to be, and what the deliverables are. So we're going to focus then on sections C and D. Where, the, where section C really covers this tasks and subtasks, milestones and go, no, go to decisions, uh, which team members are going to be working on those, uh, what's going to be accomplished, how it will be accomplished, when it will be accomplished. And, and also includes milestones and go, no, go decisions. Section D is more the project management and reporting, so it's a list of 
which types, you know, monthly reports, quarterly reports, and all, all those details, along with a list of the deliverables, which are also included in the, in the section C as well. And here's just an example on the left side of the, of the format of the SOPO, uh, and I've kind of color-coded. You want to list when it's happening. Uh, so the task one goes from months one to three. Uh, the organizations involved, and that's why I listed uh, these two companies involved in this, in this project and what they're going to be doing. Uh, and also keep in mind that if there's a full name of the company, so if we said the Ohio State University, you mentioned that the first time, and then you can put OSU in parentheses and use that throughout the rest of the discussion. Uh, the outcome of the, typically in the, in the task summary, we list the outcome of that, sum, of that task, and that's really kind of your deliverable for the task or a, or a list of deliverables for the task. The, um, and you really want to be uh, specific about it and, and how it relates to a di the subsequent tasks. In, in the subtask summary, I have listed just some very, be very specific about what you're doing. If you're going to make, uh, you're going to test five different formulations, list, we're going to test five different formulations. Don't just say, we're going to test some formulations because we really want to know kind of what is, is going to be tested. Uh, and then the, the task uh, uh, titles of the subtasks and tasks really should kind of be action oriented, like, we're analyze e waste plastic samples instead of analysis, so, so we want them to kind of be action oriented. And here's just some examples of good and not so good. Uh, the, on the left side are some not so good tasks where you say literature review, and then you say <coughs> we're going to review the literature to the relevant metal sorting technologies. Well, on the, on the right side, a better way to do it would be to say who is doing it. Uh, the, ta the, ta the task title will say a review of literature related to metal sorting, so it's a little more specific. And, and then who's doing it? University X is doing it, and they're going to look at these types of literature and, and focusing on sorting metals from electronics. So it's a, it's a little more specific to describe exactly what you're doing, but it's not, we don't want to, you know, a page of the description, we want a few sentences to, to be very specific. And then another example, uh, you know, testing samples to determine composition on the right side where it explains kind of how you're going to test the composition. So, um, and then the other, the other challenge we're having is making these milestones smart. Uh, and I forget exactly, is a specific, measurable, uh, achievable, relevant, and timely. Did I get it right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so on the right side, those are, the s are examples of smart milestones, and those are, those are actually taken from the, uh, the example SOPO template that we provide in the negotiating process. On the left side are kind of the same milestone, but not so smart. So one of, the, one of the comments I think Maggie mentioned yesterday is a milestone isn't a report. So on the left, we say a report with results showing improvement. On the right, you actually talk about specifically what your milestone relates to and how much you're improving it or you know, wh what size scale you're looking at. Be more specific. Um, and then... Uh, you know, just you know, just a couple different examples of the same thing. Just be more specific. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. A, again, it shouldn't be long. We're still going for one sentence, typically. Maybe it has to be two if it's really needs to be clarified. But, but, um, but it does have to have those details. They also, with the milestones, they have to indicate progress towards the overall project goal. We don't want to have a milestone. It, you, you, need, you need to achieve that milestone to really move, move the project forward, so we want to select milestones that, that achieve that. The other, the other parts which, which are kind of difficult is um, with certain projects is, is we want to have a one milestone every quarter of the project. Uh, and, 
and I know some projects it may take a while to get going and so you kind of ha may have to force it a little bit but there may be some wiggle room but but that's the general idea is have a, a regular milestones throughout the project and uh, and another example you know just another uh, mention this that reports aren't milestones they can be a deliverable but they're not a milestone it's what's in the report that's the milestone the the content of what your research has found and then then uh, questions to consider what is the event of the milestone how you're going to measure it that's a key point so if you say okay we're going to increase our performance by two and a half percent well how are you going to prove that so that's that's going to be included in the actual SOPO of a description of how you're actually going to prove these that th these have been accomplished go uh, go no go decisions uh, it's a risk management tool we want to make sure these projects are successful and we'll, we'll do everything we can to kind of monitor that if your, your project is we're going to make this big improvement and it's just not achievable that's a no-go so we have to have a good go no go decisions to really decide if the project moves forward and at least one annual go no go decision point for for longer projects so often those will be at the end of the first year or or a key breakthrough moment where you know if it's if you don't achieve x you know this this part of it there's no point in moving on Brian, yeah for exploratory projects are 12 months max which means most people are going to propose 12 months so is yeah. the go no go required for a exactly one year project that's what we're doing right now we're uh we're including we're also requiring those have to have one and it typically they're <coughs> they're at the towards the end of the project and kind of a decision point of yeah you, we've accomplished this so it's pro it may be a good idea to submit a full proposal later uh, sometimes if you know if you're installing a piece of equipment that could be a go no go decision point if you can't get the piece of equipment to work at month six then what's the point so uh, but we are requiring those the um, and, and the go-no-go, no go again, has to be very specific about the technical criteria that need to be achieved for, the, for that decision point. So that's, there's a slide later that kind of goes through a, additional uh, things to look for that we found have been problems, uh, that, that there's things to think about. But, um, and I think the si slides will be distributed at some point. So now the financial part, and I'll stay away from that. <laughs> I have another question on the, yeah. state, on, on the statement of work. If you have tasks and subtasks, yeah. is the detail expected to be at the task level and the subtask level and the same level of detail? What we've typically done is we would just, the, at the task level, we kind of give an overview. And sometimes we give background if it applies to all the subtasks. Uh, but, but there can be a lot of detail. Like Brian, we've got time. Would you like to go through those? So, oh, okay. so, so uh, just a, a few reminders. Uh, spell out the acronyms. There's there's a lot of jargon that that people know that you know if you're not that I may not know if I'm not in that field. Uh, so just spell out those acronyms or you know the name of a company, just for uh, conciseness later. But spell it out the first time. Be very specific uh, and specify what data is going to be collected or features are going to be examined. Uh, if, you're ha if you have models, I know some of the projects are model based and your part of the project is to find out really what data exactly needs to be, be collected as you go through it. But to the extent possible, specify what you're going to be collecting for that model. And, uh, and, and, and also when the model, a lot of times with the models, you know, we created this model, well, how are you gonna test the model? And you know, kind of think about that. Uh, don't assume that we're experts in the field, so, uh, but, but it can be for a, g a general technical audience, but, but we're not experts in systems analysis, so I'm not gonna know, know all that detail. Uh, and, uh, and or, or using jargon, 
and and also the the goals, objectives, tasks, milestones. They need to be related and have a clear flow throughout the SOPO. So I think that's it. As Brian said, there's a bunch of information in the back on the uh, budgets. Uh, so we thought, uh, because of the complexity of it, we'll give you that information. Again, check with um, uh, our finance folks, uh, Mary Jo or Michael or Kamala, uh, if you've got questions. But again, uh, as we showed yesterday graphically, you've got uh, you know the various categories uh, for person. So you've got personnel. Again, there's $120 an hour base rate that you can't. You, you would need special permission. Uh, to exceed uh, the fringe, of course, travel, equipment, supplies. Um, and again, these requirements are no different than what you would submit on, on any other uh, government proposal. There's the contractual tab where you're um, breaking out uh, various categories of that. Um, other direct uh, expenses, uh, indirect. Uh, and again, for those of you who are from organizations that have uh, uh, approved rate letters, attach those letters, uh, and as they've explained, if you don't, um, explain how you arrived at those uh, 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 rates. Um, cost share, of course, is one of the things that we saw where people didn't clearly, the cost share and the cost share letters didn't map to the proposals themselves uh, or the budgets. Uh, and then the SF-425, and. Mary Jo, what is, uh, or one of the finance, what is the SF-425? That's a form, um, that's a form that gets filed uh, quarterly, and the, that tab that's in there, it's automatically, it has formulas in there that, that should automatically um, put the dollars in there. They don't need to worry about it. Okay. All right. Very good. So with that, um, what we will do is we'll bring up the panel now. Uh, Sorry about that. I, I uh, just wanted to ask you at the $120 maximum rate, I just wanted to clarify if that also applies to the cost sharing. Yes, it does. Okay. It doesn't say it's a value rate, right? Can you enter that in? Can you still go to that for that with the benefits? If you um, attest in a, in attach a letter that tells me that your base salary rate is $120 an hour or less, then, then that's been accepted. So if you've got a lot of costs built into that number that is on your budget, um, I've been asked to request a letter from um, the proposal people that states that that, that is, that they're, that they're attesting that that dollar amount is less than the 120, 120 rate. All right, so why don't we bring the panel up now and let, uh, as they're making their way, uh, I'll uh, introduce them when they all get up here. Yeah. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. As he tried to slink away. So I'll let each of you uh, get mic'd up, uh, and then you can introduce yourselves, um, and uh, we'll go through some questions that uh, we had talked about before, and uh, then open it up to the audience. Joe, you want to start? Sure. Can you hear me? Not. <coughs> All right. My name is Joe Cresco. I'm with the Advanced Manufacturing Office, and I lead our uh, strategic analysis activities. Uh, I've been with AMO for the better part of 10 years. Half of that time as a Fed and prior to that as some kind of visiting fellow. I'm Meg Sopkowitz klein I'm a faculty at UMass Lowell and been involved in Remade since 
proposal time. Um, and uh, I served on uh, the panel uh, looking at the, do we talk about which panel? No, we don't talk about yeah, which panel. <laughs> <laughs> I served on one of the panels, the review panels. So. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Eric Massonet. I, I also served on one of the review panels. Um, I'm a professor at Northwestern University. I spent a lot of time at Lawrence Berkeley Lab as well in my career, uh, also at uh, another international agency on, on energy. So I've written a lot of proposals, and uh, we know that it's a difficult task to put everything together really concisely in a compelling way. Um, so uh, hopefully we can share some insights. Hi, I'm John Dorgan from um, Michigan State University, but I was previously at the Colorado School of Mines for about um, 25 years or so. And I've been involved in the formation of two of the NNMIs, one being the uh, IACME, which is the Composites Institute, which is also uh, not only at the Colorado School of Mines, but at Michigan State University, and, and was involved early on with Remade and uh, have been serving as a, as a reviewer. Thanks. So uh, as I mentioned, we had prepared some questions beforehand, and, and I'll just ask the questions and let you uh, go down the, the line talking about them. So what were some examples of highlights or bright spots that stood out to you in proposals from our first project call? Joe, you want to start? <clears throat> sure. I think um, you know, there's a few pieces. You know, and I think the Magdi's in introduction to this was, was quite good, uh, where we have um, the ability to sort of see, you know, graphically what's going on, uh, and and a, and a tight narrative around um, sort of information that's conveyed, I think that's particularly uh, important, uh, especially when we can kind of describe where the current technology is, um, where competing technologies exist. Uh, I think that that becomes a particular point, and so and so when we've seen that in in proposals, I think that um, helps tell a, a particularly good and and, and compelling story. Yeah, so I think definitely from the proposals I read, um, the technology uh, plan or the, the work plan was usually pretty strong. I also, also think the, um, uh, one of the other strengths in terms of the categories you know, in the proposal template was um, the team's qualifications and readiness that generally seemed to be a good, um, you know, that the people were good at, at indicating that they, you know, knew what they were doing in these categories in, these, in, in this topic area. So those were the strengths from my perspective. Uh, yeah, and I would just reinforce that um, uh, what, what Magdi and Brian said earlier about having a nice, concise project summary. So even though we may have expertise in, in the area that we're reviewing, we, you know, most reviewers have to have a, a sort of you know, easy, easy, easily accessible project summary that says what you're doing, why it's important, how you'll do it, and how you'll know that you'll succeed if your project plan comes to fruition. And so having that sort of template, uh, uh, some proposals, um, not just here, but everywhere, uh, the project summary is somewhat of an afterthought. It comes last. But uh, I like the idea of, of thinking through that ahead of time and really putting an elevator pitch into that project summary so that the reviewer can get a one or two page overview of what it is that you're proposing and have a pretty good understanding of it before diving into the, the full propo proposal. So uh, proposals that did that uh, seem to be you know, it, it helped us do a better review. Yeah, I mean, I was very excited by many of the proposals. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, great ideas out there, and uh, there's a fantastic group of people that have come around um, together uh, as part of the Remade organization. So, you know, the proposal quality in general was, was very high. Um, I'm a little bit of a stickler for details, so one of the things that will uh, make a compelling proposal for me is when you have a very um, detailed work plan, um, and I think this goes to the, the SOPO, you know, all of these proposals will be ultimately be transferred into a SOPO, and so by having a detailed work plan in the proposal, you can see that this is something that's really going to work and that there are measurable outcomes associated with it. So I guess the ones that really were most compelling to me were the ones that really followed these ideas of the SOPO and actually showed us who was going to do what and exactly what it was that they were going to be doing. Thanks. Um, are there any pitfalls uh, you think teams need to avoid for future proposals? You talked about what you liked. What were some things that uh, you saw people trip over? I want somebody else start. <laughs> we're going to go back and forth. Sure, sure. sure. Okay. Um, well, for me, I mean, um, I think these NNMIs really are, are about, you know, they're manufacturing initiatives. This is about engaging with industry in order to, you know, do job creation and these types of things. So, you know, it, it's, you have to have a substantial industrial component uh, and, 
and you know, to me that means there's cost sharing involved. So you know, a proposal where all of the cost sharing was just coming from a university is completely not compelling, I think, for this type of program. Uh, I would say um, the balance, so um, in the project plan, uh, all the teams had really strong you know, uh, uh, members sometimes coming from different areas, sometimes coming from similar areas, but um, showing that, uh, that each of the members is sort of strategically selected and how they'll work together is, is really important because uh, on its face, I mean, when you write a proposal, you know how your team will function. You know what expertise comes in at one point and how everyone will coordinate to ex execute the project plan, which let's be honest, one to two years is a pretty short timeline uh, for, uh, for a lot of the goals uh, that are put forward. So demonstrating that clearly um, was, was, was something that I saw as uh, an opportunity for some proposals. Great staff, great qualifications, but how everything meshed vis-a-vis -vis the project plan was uh, sometimes not as clear as it, as it could be. And the second aspect that relates to that is it's difficult to find that balance between having a lot of sufficient detail to prove to the reviewers <laughs> that you know what you're doing and that you've thought out all the, the various aspects of your project but uh, balancing that with having enough high-level sort of simple <laughs> messaging so that uh, the reviewer could, could follow the narrative. So finding that balance between technical detail and high-level sort of summary to you know, put into context what you're doing uh, is also an area that um, I think most proposals that I saw did a good job of that, but it is definitely a pitfall. Um, you know, each member writes their section, it comes together at the end somewhat hurriedly, those interconnected dots are sometimes missing, and maybe sometimes there was too much detail, not enough narrative tying everything together in a simple way. Yeah, um, I think for me, pitfalls that I saw, um, I would echo John's statement about the, but, uh, about the cost share, but I would say I would broaden it out to make sure your budget makes sense for what you're doing, whether you know that there, it reflects that each partner is gonna contribute in some way that makes sense for that partner and what they're doing, <laughs> uh, because it's an easy, kind of red hair, you know, flag, I suppose, red flag, if you see in that budget that there's something that just doesn't go with what the work plan is. Um, as a reviewer, you can see that as a, for me, it was an easier way to identify that maybe this isn't quite ready yet for, for funding. Can you give just maybe a little more detail? Is it the issue that you people were listed but they didn't have enough time applied to it or, or was it that they had too much yeah, time Yeah, or applied? it was lopsided with one partner versus right. the other. Um, or that um, the, 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 as John mentioned, the cost share was coming all from kind of one entity that maybe wasn't the right entity to be doing cost share uh, given the work plan, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and that's going to be unique to each proposal, so you have to work that out. But you know, just it's, it's an easy way to kind of send a flag up if you don't have that meshing with the work plan. Um, I'd say another pitfall that I came across was also e uh, echoing Eric's statement. Um, it's difficult to do, but but saying you know enough about your technology that you demonstrate depth, but that you also you know you save the room for showing that it's commercializable. And I think there were some weaknesses in my scoring sheets anyway on tech transition plan or con commercialization potential. You know, having at least a, a half a page or whatever is allotted to you to demonstrate or talk about why this is relevant to a broader audience, you know, than just your company or your team, so. And I think j just uh, to note, we we've lengthened the tech transitions uh, uh, section, uh, I think on the exploratory proposals just to give people a little more opportunity to explain uh, themselves so yeah and if you need to talk to your industry partners or somebody about that as you're writing that part because it's not you know at first I'm like tech, tech transition well there's an IP agreement you know it's yeah. not quite just regurgitating that it's talking more broadly about how the technology is gonna um, you know could make a difference more broadly in the industry mm -hmm. yeah I want to echo this point it's there's a sort of a tightrope that um, applicants need to walk to really demonstrate that there is not only the technical piece, but this commercialization potential. There's a business plan and thinking behind that. And that you can really demonstrate, describe the current state of the technology and what that future goal and target is with, with specificity. And that current state of the technology becomes important to describe and put into context. So it, the idea of having uniformity from the, you know, from the beginning sections to the end sections, 
that when a reviewer, when any of us goes through the entire thing, that it doesn't look like something that's been cobbled together at the last moment. Uh, there really needs to have that sort of hard look and that time uh, put into the whole, the whole piece. Uh, and I, I think one other thing for me that will jump out, and this may be reinforced from the perspective I have from the federal government, which is that uh, any project really has to be uh, contributing to the sort of the greater um, progress of the institute. This idea that you know this is these are pre-commercial um, te technologies that the project is not so specific just to the applicants. It really has to you know sort of um, walk that tightrope between uh, you know a viable project that can make progress. Uh, of course, that's relevant to the to the companies that are uh, you know the, to the partners that are involved. Uh, industry, academia, et cetera, but, but also really kind of contributes to that, to that broader perspective. And that, 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 that it can be difficult to do because, you know, uh, especially when companies get involved, they have their own interests in mind. Uh, so, so how to do that and how to frame that well. And I think, you know, both can be done. Um, a project can make progress towards the, the goals and targets that um, the performers want to have um, that are, they're, they're interested in. But that broader perspective has to be there uh, because if it's not, you know, this may be uh, too narrow, too specific, uh, and may not have that broad uh, impact. Yeah, I, I just want to just jump in a little bit. I think and this echoes something that both uh, Joe and Meg said. You know, the polymers, and most of my expertise is in polymers and plastics, and so, you know, the idea of recycling plastic materials is not a new idea. And so, you know, there's, there's uh, symposia, special symposia that were held by, like, the American Chemical Society as early as, you know, the early 1970s. And so when I'm reading these proposals and, you know, all of the references are to papers that have been published in the last five years, that to me is a pitfall, right? It, it shows me that you don't really, you know, have an appreciation for the, the breadth of the technical data and literature that's out there. And so a lot of people are proposing things that have been done in the past, right, simply because they're not well versed in the literature. And I mean, that, that's just a critical pitfall, you know, you, we, we just shouldn't be spending money to do things that have already been done in the past. And so, you know, a, a deeper appreciation of the literature when you're writing proposals is, is really critical. I'm reminded uh, I had a colleague at uh, Global Research down the hall from me, and he had on his uh, door, you know, GE Global Research, where a year in the lab can save you an afternoon in the library. <laughs> and of course, it was a little tongue in cheek, but, uh, you know. You got to do a little bit of homework. Yeah, and I, I would add something I forgot to to that as far as pitfalls go. Be careful making overly ambitious statements too about what you think impact you think you can make because I saw things where I'm like, oh yeah, I don't I don't believe that. Like, and uh, <laughs> I just I just didn't buy it. So it's hard because you want to say this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but just don't say. It. And you want to be quantitative, but if you are quantitative in a way that makes it absolutely like not believable, that's Right. If you For can reviewers, that's if yeah. you can defend it, if you can defend it, that's good. I mean, sure, the idea yeah. is to make progress, but right. but to see things that are hanging out there without, uh, you like know, a bold sweeping. We're going to save <laughs> five quads of energy, and then you know, within five years, <laughs> yeah. it's like that's you know, there's there's no basis yeah. for that, right. and, and where does that come from? Yeah. yeah. Um, how can teams most clearly communicate the strength of their proposal team to reviewers? You've, some of you have touched on it a little bit, but uh, what else might you add? So I'll, I'll take the first crack at that. Uh, I sort of got at this point somewhat with my earlier comment about um, you've got to show that the team makes sense, that it's that the people have the right skills and so forth. You all know that because you're assembling your teams and you're choosing your partners in a way that's going to help you execute, you know, your grand vision. Uh, but it doesn't always come across that clearly in the proposal when. Uh, sometimes it looks like it's written in piecemeal fashion and connecting those dots is an afterthought. So make, make that a central feature maybe. Make sure it gets into your, your project summary. Um, you know, project summaries are short. You've got to choose your words carefully, but showing why this team is uniquely positioned to accomplish the big goals that you're going to accomplish, uh, make sure that that gets the same sort of visibility as the technical merit of your proposal, uh, you know, the impacts and so forth, because it, I think it's a key goal of the Institute is um, you know, building partnerships that will have lasting impact and that are really world class. Yeah, I would just add um, just to that, I think diversity on the project team, meaning that they're from different kind of perspectives, whether it's departments or kind of like disciplines or whatever you want to call it, that that kind of interdisciplinary can usually, uh, to me, is usually more compelling than kind of like a single 
single kind of discipline focus? Yeah, I would. I, I, I think what has impressed me, you know, across the board with the with the institutes is the the quality, um, depth, and background of the people that are that are involved. So I don't think we have a, a problem with having great talent, but um, working together as teams, demonstrating how that team is going to work together. I think having interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams together is important, but it's not sufficient to just say, we've assembled a multidisciplinary team. How are those um, different uh, pe you know, um, experts going to come together to, to, to achieve progress? I think teasing that out, um, it doesn't have to be a lot of real estate in the, in the narrative to do that, but making clear that, uh, that there is a team approach to solving this. Uh, there's no individual with these types of projects to make a truly sort of national and global scale impact. No individual is going to be do this. These are going to be these are going to be team uh, team projects. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, for myself, I think um, <coughs> the expertise in the team has to sort of reflect what's in the work plan. So what I mean by that is, say, you know, if you're doing TRL, say, you know, two to four, it's perfectly fine to have all you know um, scientific people on on the on the on the as your as your team members. But if you're saying, well, we're going to start up a spin off a company that's going to be involved in recycling, then you know you need people that have business ex expertise as as part of your team. Uh, similarly, you know if you're going to be conducting something like a marketing study, then you know you need somebody that has marketing expertise. So again, I think you know for a compelling proposal, you know if you really want it to 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 be a home run, then you know you need to tie the work plan to the people um, that are as part of your team. And you know that gets all the way into the detail that was just discussed previously on the SOFO, right? You have tasks and they're assigned to specific people. You know, don't assign a, a business task to you know a, a chemical engineering college professor, right? It's just not the appropriate assignment. Uh, did you feel that there were specific sections of the proposal where teams fell short in achieving that mark? You know, what were the? Uh, was there any one section that was the hardest? You know, like where consistently you saw issues beyond what you've said before? I just glanced at my scores, and for me, the, the generally the lowest category tended to be the commercialization and transition, uh, transition demonstrating that. Yeah, I would, <coughs> I would echo that, bad. too. I think that's probably the area. I think we're, we're really, we have a lot of people thinking about the science in the front end, uh, but how to take that all the way to the end. And like I mentioned earlier, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's tough because you need to give a compelling picture, a compelling narrative for how this is, going to be impactful, but be, be realistic about it. So I think a commercialization, the commercialization side is, is key, having the right people involved. Uh, and if you don't, you, I think you kind of need to um, go out there and find, uh, find those people, or at least you know, show how you're going to, that you're think, thinking about that. It can be an early TRL project, but you still can't just say, well, look, we're just early phase. We're not, we don't care about the downstream because these really, you know, the, the idea with these institutes is really to um, you know, make change. And so if you're gonna make change, it's gotta get out there in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I, you know, I completely sympathize with my fellow academicians that are out there saying, well, you know, I have this great idea, it needs development. You know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to go to an industry partner and say, you know, let's do this because it's, it's too far down the road. But, you know, one of the ways you can still tie that in is it's, it's quite easy uh, to get just letters of support. So rather than say, you know, ideally you get, you know, full, full blown one to one or two to one cost share or something like that, that's fantastic, right? But that's difficult to achieve, especially when you're at low TRL levels. But still, if you're in contact with the industry, and most of us are, you know, it's not that hard to get a letter that simply says, you know, uh, we've been in discussions with Professor Dorgan and we understand he's working on problem X. If he can, uh, you know, evolve until, you know, goal Z and, and alpha are uh, reached, then we would be interested in providing uh, cost share. And, and to me, that's, that's very compelling, right? Because it's saying that there, at least there is a path forwards to uh, engage industry if you can meet certain you know, uh, smart milestones, right? Things that are measurable. And so you, you can get them to easily put together a letter like that. And it, and it shows the tie uh, without really having to get the full blown uh, cost share commitment. And there are other organizations too. I think you know, at the state level, there are state economic development agencies that are, that are involved in technology development. Depends on the state that you're in. But I think doing that extra homework and going out and finding other partners—they might not be traditional 
But at least what you're doing is you're getting out there. And, and what you will find is, you know, it may not just be a source of maybe co-funding, but it's a source of expertise. Um, you know, many of these, um, let's say, state technology development kind of organizations that do economic development have ties into industry. They have ties into how to develop a great business plan. So there, there are different elements that you can go and tap into. And, and just by doing that, you're, you know, it's not just checking a box and getting a letter. It's actually making fruitful and useful connections. Before I turn it over to the audience, let me ask this question. A number of you are, come from academic backgrounds. How is writing a proposal for remade different than what you might write for NSF or, or other funding agencies? Well, the first answer for me is that you just have less space to talk about your science. There's just less space there to do that, and you want to go on and on, you know. <laughs> so you, you just have to really be concise on the, the scientific basis for what it is you're doing because you don't have the room, and it's still a good thing to provide that basis. So um, for me, that's the biggest difference. But yeah. There's other things. I, I think showing the real world relevance, not only to, well, the world, the big problems that the projects are trying to solve, but also to remade itself. So we can all learn from each other. There's a lot of data that could be generated in various projects. There are a lot of knowledge gaps on, you know, when it comes to material cycles and, and how different technologies could fit in and what the impacts could be. So in many academic proposals, we try to show that we're, you know, we're coming up with, uh, you know, uh, sort of a new, we're forging new intellectual terrain and that's always important. But here, I think one of the challenges is in showing that you're doing great work, but also that it helps meet the goals of remade, it help, helps meet societal goals, helps meet national goals, and that sometimes takes a bit of a different perspective when you write a proposal that some academics, we, we don't always have to weave in so directly and in such short amount of space. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what we strive to do when we're writing something to the National Science Foundation is to really look at like a discovery-based project. That is, you know, there's a phenomena that's not really understood and we're really saying, look, you know, we, we have uh, known facts that say uh, this or that happens and in some ways they seem to be conflicting and we're trying to resolve that, right? I mean, there's a controversy there. What way does it really work? And so it, it's very deep and it's very fundamental, right? We're really trying to get at, you know, we're trying to discover what's really going on. When you're doing uh, work with industry, I mean, the idea, at least in, in my mind, is that, you know, we sort of know how systems work and it's a matter of getting the pieces together in order to achieve, a, you know, a goal, and that goal, you know, I think somebody previously mentioned the triple bottom line. I think in, in these types of endeavors, that's what we're really trying to do is to advance the triple bottom line. And of course, part of that is that, you know, you do have to have the first bottom line, the, the profitability. Um, you know, I've, I've never run an NSF project that turned a profit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, and I'll just put in, I, I think most of my um, perspective might be a little bit different. I spent a lot of my career, you know, running a, a small institute, uh, in electrotechnologies, and I would work closely with industry, and it was really important to be concise. And I would just maybe echo, you know, to kind of turning that around, like what I would continuously ask myself is, you know, the what, why, and how. What are you doing? What is this, what are we doing here, this, this impactful, and why can it make it, uh, you know, a difference? And, and how are we doing it? And if you can really, in the project summary, condense that down, the what, why, and how, and make a compelling case, bring it into context, um, you know, I think you're almost halfway there. You know, the rest of that, you know, you still needs to be well developed, right? You know, really getting into the details of how you're going to, to, to make, make progress. But that, that perspective, I think, you know, keeping in mind of, you know, conciseness, targeting your audience, uh, and making sure that context is there so they understand the big picture, and then make sure you bring in the details later, I, th I think, I think is, 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 is important. So let's turn it over to the audience. If you've got questions, uh, if you do, raise your hand. Uh, again, because we're videotaping this, so um, we'll get a microphone over to you. No questions? We answered them all. Good. <laughs> Emily. Sure. Um, so, one, are you in need of more reviewers? And two, just from a logistical standpoint, if you had to 
put a guesstimate on how much time reviewers spend, what would you say it is? Well, I, I, didn't think the, I didn't think the assignment was overly onerous, uh, at least not by academic standards. Uh, so uh, I think I had something like between, on the order of 10 or so proposals to review. And I would spend, uh, prior to the conversations, probably about an hour each or so, something like that, in terms of reading it, studying it, checking some of the references, those types of things. And then we came together and had a panel discussion. Um, but at that point, you know, there already was pretty good consensus uh, and so the panel conversations were, what, an hour, 90 minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think it was overly burdensome, but uh, perhaps the people were kind to me and other people had to do more. I, I would echo that. It was one to two hours per proposal and then the, the panel review session, maybe 90 minutes and some follow-up, uh, not too onerous. And I think in general it's better to have more reviewers. Uh, I think... Uh, in my particular panel, we had just enough. It may have been good to have one or two more additional sets of eyes, uh, but I think that overall the, it was a pretty well-run process with, with the right experts in place, at least for the panel that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? So, Emily, just to answer your question, yeah, we are looking for reviewers. Um, uh, there was a note up earlier. Um, I think uh, if you're interested in, in being a reviewer, you can send me an email, and uh, we'll be reaching out to a number of you. Uh, again, industry reviewers, we're looking for uh, reviewers from industry as well because, again, you bring a unique perspective to the table and, and can see some of those, how is this going to fit into the field. Other questions? I mean, just to, I think if you had sort of one sort of phrase that I would use, it would be, you know, to, to under-promise and over-deliver. So, I mean, you know, you can run into trouble if you say, well, you know, at the end of this project, we're going to be recycling 5% more polyethylene than we do now. I mean, you know, if it's a six-month project, that's just, you know, not credible, right? So, you, you do want to have measurable outcomes, but you don't want to be, uh, you know, claiming the moon and the stars. Uh, over a you know a, a half a million dollar two year project, I mean, uh, it's it's hard to move the needle much with 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 that type of effort, right? So maybe just uh, one final question for for the panel: If you could boil down your advice to the the one thing um, that is most important to think about. Oh, I guess I just jumped the gun then. <laughs> I think I yeah. just said. Uh, if the rest of you could take John's perfect <laughs> example and give yeah, one, ex you know, one final thing. Yeah. I mean, I would just say cohesiveness and clarity in, in the project proposal is always a good, you know, rule of thumb. Uh, and the project proposals that I read that did that had a better chance of me actually, you know, knowing how to better review it uh, th than others. Um, so you can help the review process by being very clear and connecting dots. You might think it's obvious because you've been working on it for a month, uh, but not often, I mean, often times a reviewer will pick it up and not come at it with the same background. So a lot of hand-holding would be good. The, the other plea I'll put in is I'm someone who works on analysis and having good data is really an important aspect of, of doing good analytical and modeling work. And when it comes to these grand challenges that Remade is trying to solve, there's, there's a humongous lack of data when it comes to understanding material cycles and recycling opportunities and technologies and their costs and their applicable markets and so forth. So proposals that, you know, the proposals are all doing really groundbreaking work, but uh, proposals that also included some, some let's say, uh, knowledge sharing, whether it's data sets, whether it's insights, whether it's you know, prog pro progress updates that could be fed into the, the overall remake process, in my eyes were, were really uh, great because uh, not only would you produce something that's hopefully going to have large impact, but along the way, others can learn about what you're doing and maybe have data to make better decisions or, or better understand the challenges faced or the opportunities created through other technologies uh, similar to yours. Let me just jump on that just as a, you know, I think one of the great things with Remade, having this analysis node, you know, if you're in, you know, one of the techno technology development nodes, how are you thinking, you know, have you contacted, you know, the folks with the analysis node to, to see where the data, you know, um, gaps are, how this mm -hmm. may contribute, and you, you may see, again, you're sort of expanding out um, that sort of that team to, to, to drive to an overall greater project, I think, you know, thinking about this is, is key, and I, it's a really good point, Eric. 
if I had to boil it down, I'd say the one thing that I want to see is a compelling story, and that means that th there should be an explanation of the size of the problem, that there are a lot of big problems in this area, so that should be easy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the size of the problem, and then this innovative piece that's also grounded that it's not already been done before, right, um, that you're adding. So that connection there, like big problem, we have the solution that's innovative. To me, that's the, 